Hey everyone, this is Alex, and welcome back to another episode of the Oregon Bridge Podcast. Yeah, I think it's important to probably distinguish between how the system works and how the system talks about itself working. Modern money theory is a theory of modern money. It is a theory of state money, that is to say, not just the money that comes from governments, but the relationship between that and all other forms of money, because there isn't just one kind of money in the economy. Financial systems are prone to inherent crises. They do not trend towards equilibrium. They actually trend towards periodic crises. Boom, bust, boom, bust. Hey everyone, thanks again for joining us for another episode. This is just Alex today filling in for Reagan and Ben while they're very busy during session. But uh, coming with you to uh, one of the most, uh, I would say, mind-boggling from a policy perspective episodes that we've had before. Today we have Professor Rohan Gray. Uh, Professor Rohan Gray is a professor at Willamette. Uh, University, where he focuses on the legal design and regulation of money and finance. Uh, He's also the research research director of the Fiat Currency Institute, a consultant to the UN International Telecommunications Group. Uh, And he has a bunch of other affiliations as well. So I'll make sure to put those in the bio since uh, he's he's clearly quite a busy guy. Uh, And I wanted to interview uh, the professor here because I'd actually been reading about him quite a bit, uh, whether it's the New York Times, NPR, I believe he also did a podcast with Jon Stewart. Uh, at one point, and he's, uh, I would say, someone who is truly interacting both or uh, engaging with and changing both uh, national and international finance. Uh, and of course, he's doing it right from Portland, Oregon, which I thought was, you know, super interesting in Oregon. And I would say usually doesn't have such a dramatic impact on these issues. But uh, we talk about a lot of things through the episode. It's really wonky. Uh, he talks about the politics of money, uh, you know, kind of what he sees as the U.S. financial system that was set up, uh, how different policies from both the right and the left will influence both the U.S. Treasury, the Federal Reserve, also how Congress spends its money. Uh, truly kind of a mind-boggling episode in terms of just kind of the inner workings of the financial side of the U.S. government. And uh, he's also very famous, and you may have seen him in headlines because uh, he coined the idea of the trillion do- coin the idea coined the idea of the trillion dollar coin uh, to help to fill uh, the deficit so that the you know U.S. government doesn't default. Uh, that's a policy that him and I believe a few other economists had come up with that's been gaining uh, quite a lot of interest and quite a lot of traction from I would say uh, both folks on the right who are criticizing it, probably folks on the left who are criticizing it, mainstream publications and all across. So. Uh, yeah, really interesting episode. I would just say we did have problems making his audio work with the microphone. So unfortunately, this is uh, uh, poor quality from an audio perspective, but the content is actually great uh, if you can get past that. So definitely uh, make sure to check it out. It's a pretty long episode, super wonky. And I think that you'll learn a lot and find uh, him of interest. Uh, so yeah, let us know what you think of the episode. Of course, always make sure to subscribe and give us five stars and go ahead and check out our sub stack as well. Uh, we're posting a weekly newsletter with the top stories in Oregon politics. Definitely something that you don't want to miss. We've seen just incredible growth and interest through that. And you just type in Oregon Way and you'll find our sub stack uh, there where you can check out our different content. So thanks again for tuning in and enjoy the episode. Harang Long PC has always recognized that achieving our clients' goals sometimes requires a change in the law. And in other situations, clients need help stopping or changing proposed amendments to the law that put their interests at risk. For decades, we have played a role in shaping Oregon law on many subjects, from narrow regulations to major policy changes implicating billions of dollars. Our lawyers work with clients to draft legislation, prepare legal opinions and testimony to share with legislators, coordinate with professional lobbyists, and work directly with policymakers. To learn more about Harang Long's policy and politics practice, go to harang.com. That's H-A-R-R-A-N-G.com. All right, everybody, really excited today to bring you Rowan Gray, Professor Rowan Gray, who is joining us from Portland. Rowan, how's it going? Yeah, not too bad. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Great. Are you freezing down there in Portland right now, or how, how's everything going from the weather perspective? Well, I moved from Ithaca, New York, so it all feels like balmy summer weather relative to winters over there, but I have certainly <laughs> been warmer. 
Yes, that, that, that's a very fair point. Yeah, I have a few friends who went to school up there, and yeah, they thought it was, I guess, somewhat similar to Antarctica uh, from the conditions that, that they had described. So it's a very good. Yeah, I, I was reliably okay. informed. I was reliably informed when I moved here that it was quite temperate weather, and then I moved here during the summer of uh, ice storms and firestorms. So anything relative to that feels feels mild, actually. So. Okay, that was the, actually when I, I brought my wife out to, to Portland for that, and she originally grew up in Florida. So yeah, the, the 60 or 50 year historic ice storm or whatever that was, was not that great. <laughs> and then the, arrived, orange, the orange haze going out to the horizon was also a bit rough. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it was, it was, it was uh, quite the catalyst of the year. So great. Well, we're really excited to have you on the podcast. And as I was telling you right before we started recording this, generally I will do, and I, of course, I will still do because folks just listen to it, kind of an intro of your background. But you have a lot of jobs and you have a lot of degrees. And, you know, of course, you, you know, took all this experience and, you know, eventually ended up in, in Portland. Give us the story. You know, how did you get interested in, you know, we'll talk a little bit about kind of your policy expertise areas in just a little bit, but uh, how did all the schooling start? I know that you also served as a music teacher, if I'm not mistaken. How do we go from music teacher to expert and policy theorist in MMT and monetary policy? Yeah, thank you for the question. Well, I grew up as the son of a, of a lawyer and a music teacher, so I became a music teacher and a lawyer. I don't think you need to be Sigmund Freud to work, work that one out. But I, I came from a family of music educators, and I was playing and teaching music throughout my childhood and then into my teens. And then when I graduated, I did a degree in international studies, but I was practicing and playing music and teaching it during that time and enjoying it a lot. Part of that degree required me to go on exchange, and I went to the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And while I was there, I met people who were at the Wharton Business School, and then I moved to New York after that, and they went into Wall Street. And I was always planning on going to law school, but I thought I might as well get some of the music out of my system. The horn teacher I had in Australia, who was one of the people that encouraged me to think about the United States actually went to Juilliard. And so he kind of gave me an into the New York scene. And I ended up doing some uh, performance studies at Manhattan School of Music. And I was planning on actually going into education law, education policy. And so I did a master's degree in education at the Teachers College in New York. And before law school, I was offered a job teaching at a school that I had been volunteering at in the music program. So I deferred law school for a year. And I taught it, I taught sixth grade social studies and third to sixth grade music at a school in Harlem, a charter school. And then I went to law school. And at that point, uh, in the early 2010s, it was at the height of the sort of charter school reform movement, which I was not particularly enamored of, even though I ended up working at one briefly. So I switched from that into family law, children's law, representing kids in custody, abuse, visitation, neglect kind of cases after and during law school. But the other major thing that happened to me was, of course, the 2008 financial crisis. I went to school, I went to university in 2007, right at the start of the crisis. And the school that I had mm. gone to and then worked at and the Saturday school that my family had worked at were all pretty hard hit by that crisis in Australia. The old joke is when America sneezes, the rest of the world catches cold. And so part of me coming over here and then going to a school like Penn and, and being around those kinds of people was trying to understand exactly what Wall Street had managed to do that, that had hurt everybody across the entire world. And so I found myself learning more about money. It was at a time when the blogs, the blogosphere was at its sort of zenith and there was a really rich, interesting debate. And I had been lucky enough to study as part of my international studies degree, what they call political economy, which is sort of heterodox economics that looks more at history and social context and power dynamics than simply the kind of mathematical graph equations that you see in a lot of regular econ classes. So I kind of came in with a bit of a framework and I tried to understand more and more. And luckily when you're in New York, it's a good location to, to think about money and power. And so when I went to law school, it became clear that there was a sort of big gaping hole in the legal education system around money and finance. And so being an educator, I put on a series of events as a student. I kind of invited people, which eventually became a nonprofit of mine. That's an educational nonprofit called the Modern Money Network uh, with colleagues of mine. Mm. And I thought I would do that at night while doing my day job as a children's attorney. But it turns out they're both actually very hard jobs. And when the time came to sort of choose, there were a lot of amazing children's attorneys out there. There weren't that many people working at that sort of high level of money and finance and macroeconomics. And so I figured that was probably the better use of my time. And I tried to pivot into legal academia. I went to, to Cornell and did uh, further legal work there. Uh, I had spent my last year of law school in the UK. A friend described it as going on exchange while on exchange. But I, I wanted to see the kind of British legal system as I had seen the Australian one close up and the American one relatively close up by that point. 
and I came back and did a legal PhD program, uh, which I'm still finishing up at, uh, uh, at Cornell and then went over and started teaching at Willamette University in Salem. And I teach contracts, business organizations, financial institutions, uh, my own class on law, money and technology. And I work with others around nowadays at an intersection of, of money and, and technology, digital finance, which in part, I think is thanks to my father, who was an, a scientist and a lawyer and one of the first people to use a, a computer in the Australian legal scene as well as a law professor at Columbia that, uh, named Evan Moglin, who, who introduced me to the world of sort of technology politics. So that's the kind of stuff that I do nowadays, the future of money, the future of digital money, public infrastructure, that kind of thing. But a lot of it is still based on the same reasons I got into being a, a music teacher for daycares and elementary schools, which is if somebody gets to turn off all the money, then it doesn't matter what area of work you're interested in. That's a sort of first order problem. Yeah. So if there was a world where everybody could get a job who wanted to, to be a music teacher and there was enough funding for the arts and for public schools and things, I probably wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. So until there is, uh, this is the work. Yeah, and, and I think, and I introduced some of this in the intro, one of the things that interested me the most, partially, it wasn't even just your position, but like your location, right? Being in Portland, working at Willamette Law School, not generally, I would say, is a place where, you know, politics and finance come to match. And that's not an attack on Willamette or anything. I would just think, of course, some university either in D.C., maybe some somewhere in New York, maybe some think tank, you know, in New York or, I don't know, some McKinsey think tank or something like that. And, of course, like you're in Portland having a lot of impact on the national and international dialogue when it comes to some of these issues we'll talk about in just a little bit. How has it been? I mean, right, I'm assuming you're, you're interacting with people like Jon Stewart, probably talking with people on Wall Street. And again, you're on the West Coast, which, of course, always makes fun of the East Coast for being behind. You know, we know the stock market opens as well. Also, how has that been right to just like literally from a location perspective? I mean, you're having a big impact on a lot of these issues, which I think most people, you know, kind of think happen within the corridor of that. How has that been to kind of, you know, really see your ideas and kind of start to gain a profile on these issues as well? Yeah, well, I, I mean, I was certainly, I think, I grew up in Sydney. It's a city of, you know, 5 million people. And I moved to New York. And then I moved from there to London and then back to New York. So certainly for a long time, one of the reasons I wanted to go to law school in those places was to get an education at the center of kind of where I thought a lot of it was happening. But we moved here in 2020, right at the start of COVID, really. And so it was a kind of perfect time to work out how to maintain my professional activities remotely because suddenly everybody was working out how to maintain all professional activities remotely. And luckily I had built a pretty strong network and a pretty strong set of connections over on the East Coast. So by the time I moved here, it was sort of just continuing what I had already built uh, and continuing to build on it. You know, part of the way that a lot of this works is like a snowball. Once it kind of gets enough gravity, it just keeps getting bigger as it rolls down the hill. I was lucky mm -hmm. enough also to sort of have a bit of a soft exit going up to Ithaca, New York, when I moved to Cornell. Still in New York, I can still take the train down or drive, uh, take the bus down or drive down when I need to, or, or you know, go down New York and take the train over to to DC, but it's it's far enough away that you know that the professional colleagues and networks of mine started to have to shift to well, we're not going to see them every day. And then the other part of it, of course, is simply that uh, New York is not DC, and that on one hand it's close, but on the other hand it's still not next door. And so to the extent that you're in one or the other, you, you do have to make trade-offs about that. The reality is that my, first of all, when you're on the academic job market, you know, you don't always get to go exactly where you want to go, but I actually love Oregon, turns out. I didn't know I would, but I, I absolutely love it. I will be here if they let me stay. And uh, my partner is from Northern California, from Davis, and she went to Puget Sound. And so part of our initial commitment was, hey, you want to you come up with me to, uh, to Ithaca for a few years. She ended up doing her graduate teaching studies. She's a second grade teacher at Binghamton University up there. You know, you do that with me and I'll try and make sure we end up on the West Coast. And uh, as far as law schools go, a law school that's across the road from the state house is, is sort of still in line with my vision of the kind of lawyering I like to do, which is sort of, you know, where, mm -hmm. where, the, where the work is. Very cool. Yeah, I love that. I, I love the, the trying out Ithaca then, then going back to the Pacific Northwest too. But great. So I want to talk to you about, you know, kind of a, an issue you're considered an expert, and I think have been having a lot of impact, which is modern monetary theory, which we will talk about in more detail. But first, and this is also, by the way, and I think I had at least one former professor who listens to our podcast. I was an economics major at the University of Oregon, so this podcast will definitely put a lot to test in terms of what I actually remember from school in some ways, too. So hopefully I don't embarrass myself too much. 
but what exactly is modern monetary theory, also known as what I always call it, MMT? Yeah, MMT, sometimes they call it modern money theory. So the term modern money is actually a quote, a kind of term of reference from John Maynard Keynes, who in his treatise on money said, the state comes in first of all as the authority of law that determines, you know, the, not only what's in a contract, but what a contract can be paid with. And it, it asserts that right, you know, in the way that it asserts the right to edit a dictionary to say what the meaning of legal words is. And it has asserted that right. All modern states have asserted that right for the last 5,000 years. But the word modern there doesn't mean sort of 20th century modernism or anything like that. It means social structures where we have legal institutions and governing institutions that are bigger than face-to-face -face kinship relations, right? When we use the written word, when we use lawyers, when we use whatever kind of government you want to call it, a religious authority, a warlord, a, a tribal elder, you know, council, all the way through to monarchies and nation states and hopefully democracy. But that all of them essentially have a system of legal enforcement, property rights, contracts, but also taxes and public goods. And they have a system in which you have to pay things. Right? We don't charge people in corn and in, in hours of labor, we charge them in money. And whatever we accept in payment of not just taxes, but fees and fines and court judgments for private suits, everything like that, whatever we recognize there has value in the same way as a get out of jail free card in Monopoly has value, at least until the point in the game where it's safer to be in jail than it is to be landing on hotels. And then suddenly that thing has no value. But as long as legal liability is something people want to get away from, as long as the tax man is something you have to pay, as long as property rights are things that people want to enforce, then legal authorities are going to have to have something that they accept. And whatever that acceptance is, has value as money. And once there's a thing that has that value, private actors will use it in their own private relationships. I will use it because I know you need to pay taxes and I know everyone else that you need to interact with also has to pay taxes, obviously. So modern money theory is a theory of modern money. It is a theory of state money. That is to say, not just the money that comes from governments, but the relationship between that and all other forms of money, because there isn't just one kind of money in the economy. The money that most of us use most of the time is bank credit or bank liabilities, bank deposits. And there are all other kinds of money as we can now see in the world of crypto. So one of the early kind of forefathers of MMT is a monetary theorist named Hyman Minsky, who became very famous after 2008 for describing how financial systems are prone to inherent crises. They do not trend towards equilibrium, as some economics textbooks will say, they actually trend towards periodic crises, boom, bust, boom, bust. But he also had a famous line about money where he said, everybody can create money. The challenge is to get it accepted. And the answer from the MMT perspective is that public authorities, at least to the extent that the government isn't in the state of you know, political breakdown, and I don't mean breakdown like the debt ceiling, I mean breakdown like a nation state is about to cease to exist or have a revolution. As long as it's not mm -hmm. at that level, then public money has a unique claim to why it's more accepted than anybody else's random IOU. And so MMT is really an attempt to understand the monetary system in its granular operational detail, understanding all of the different nuances of all the institutions and all the balance sheet flows, right? Understanding it almost like everybody's walking around a computer game with a balance sheet above their head instead of a health bar and a mana bar. You have your assets and your liabilities and you have to be able to actually trace all the financial flows in a way that's consistent with itself. You can't pretend that money flows out of one place without talking about where else it goes. So just to give one quick joke about that, there's this meme that I really liked that, that's sort of a picture of the planets and it says, CNN just said that the world is $600 trillion in debt. Well, who the beep do we owe? Jupiter? <laughs> the point being that you can only be in debt if you're in debt to somebody else and your debt is their asset. So any money that is a, a liability because the government is promising it to be accepted back in payment of taxes. This is an IOU good for $1 of tax relief. It's someone else's asset. And that's just as true for the national debt as it is for, for currency. So MMT is trying to understand that system, how those economies work, not sort of small subsistence economies, not a private family economy, but the economy of, of social structures with governing institutions. And in addition to the money side, the last thing that they really emphasize a lot is its relationship to labor. The idea that unemployment is basically at its most fundamental level, stripped of all the other sort of social narratives, is the act of looking for money and being willing to do basically anything with your labor to earn it. 
but they're not being opportunities to do that. So recognizing that unemployment is actually a creature, a creation of the monetary system itself. If I create a money that nobody else needed until I imposed taxes on them, and now suddenly you're unemployed in my money, and I create enough money and only give it to 19 people out of 20, then the fact that the 20th person can't find a job is not their fault, but the fault of the people who made the money and made the system that way. So it connects the two parts of what we consider to be macroeconomics traditionally, full employment and, and prices and finance in a unified framework in a way that builds on previous traditions, what they call post-Keynesian traditions, not sort of uh, after Keynes, as well as Marxian mm -hmm. traditions and other heterodox traditions. Uh, so it has an intellectual history, but a lot of it was also founded in part through the sort of sheer will and then collective action of a group of people uh, led in the early days in part by a, a financier named Warren Mosler, who was a, a banker and, and an innovator in various derivative and swap products and things, and who basically had gone to the center of the system and, and could report back from there with the granular knowledge of someone who had, had actually sort of worked the plumbing for their own purposes. So it was a combination of academics and practitioners. And when I got involved, the lawyers were starting to show up, of which I was one of the earliest, I think. Gotcha. And so, so tell me, so I want you to kind of help us understand two things. One is, you know, you essentially talked about, in a way, this, this would certainly be a different structure than how the U.S. government, you know, I guess, deals with its monetary policy right now. So what, what is sort of the status quo, you know, in terms of, like, how do, we, how do we look at that now? And then leading into that, my question is, and I, you know, talked to you about this a little bit before we started recording, but... When I was first learning about, uh, I don't even know if it was really called MMT, but it was generally sort of the libertarian folks, kind of like the Ron Paul people, because I was into that whole thing in 2012. And they were, you know, very afraid of this, people on the right, the sort of free market folks. MMT was kind of like the ultimate boogeyman in terms of, you know, this is a scary, at least a government intervention, et cetera. But it's actually gained quite a bit of popularity, I would say, not on, not with tons of people on the right, but definitely with with more folks on the right as well, like this idea is starting to become more popularized. So can you help walk us through both of those kind of what, what does the current system look like now? And then why do you think this idea uh, is also gaining traction? Like what was sort of the motivator behind this to come up, you know, to a more, I would say, serious level of discussion than maybe it has been in the past? Yeah, I think it's important to probably distinguish between how the system works and how the system talks about itself working. And, I, you know, you've had political operatives on this podcast in the past, I'm sure you, you know, you're no, no stranger to political spin. And that's just as true in the economics discipline and the economics textbooks, right? Famously, the Nobel Prize winner, Paul Samuelson, said, I don't care who writes a nation's laws as long as I get to write their textbooks. And so thinking about the, the way in which the education we receive about how money works is itself part of creating a belief system that may or may not actually describe the world in which we live in. But to, to kind of go to your second question, maybe, and then go back, you know, I don't, uh, Stephen Colbert once said, reality has a well-known liberal bias. I'm, I'm not a liberal. Um, I consider myself a leftist. But the idea that financial systems have a well-known MMT bias in the sense that MMT is descriptively accurate. Whatever else you think about myself or other people in the MMT community or some of the policy prescriptions that we draw from our analysis or the political goals that we are all trying to achieve, or at least a number of us are collectively trying to achieve, whatever you think about all of that, at a purely descriptive analytic layer, understanding what we are talking about, understanding what MMT is describing is empowering because it's accurate. It's like in the same way as learning physics is empowering. It, it allows you to understand the world around you better, or maybe engineering is a better example, right? You want to make sure that you get into a machine that doesn't blow up or that if you have to jump out of a window with, mm -hmm. with the, you know, the, uh, a, a, a tarpaulin around you. you want to make sure it's big enough so that you don't go splat on the ground, right? Whatever you think about why you're doing that, making sure you're not actually getting stuff wrong at an empirical level is helpful for everybody. And so the reason that Warren came to a lot of it was because he was a banker that wanted to make money. And if he understood the system better, he would make less losing bets. A lot of people in the financial world, people who probably don't share my politics in the slightest, have a lot that they have found value in MMT because it has helped them make money and avoid bad trades. For a long period of time, for example, one of the big questions that people were asking publicly was, well, isn't QE gonna be inflationary? Quantitative easing, if we replace a bunch of government debt out in the economy with central bank reserves, isn't that monetizing the debt? This is what people like 
Ron Paul and others were describing, because for them, there is a thing called the money supply. And if we inflate it, we are sort of putting water into our whiskey. It gets weaker and weaker. But the reality is that there is no single money supply. As I kind of said before, anyone can make money. Money is almost like credit is the best way to think of it with a special kind of characteristic, special edged credit. You know, if you go to a bar and you buy a hundred dollars worth of drinks and you don't pay your tab until the end of the night, the bar gets to say, yeah, we've got a hundred dollars coming in. That's an asset to us. And you get to say, I've still got a hundred dollars in my bank account. The money is essentially in two places at once until you pay, until you settle, you have taken your money and split it into where it exists and where you're promising it will exist. And that difference, partially it's about time, partially it's about relationships between others is sort of where the magic act of credit comes. When I teach it in my classes, I teach, you know, that, that image from Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon with the white light being split into all the colored light through the triangular prism. That's the way that money can become somewhere between two of people in debt with each other. And then when you repay it, it goes away again. So uh, people make money off this stuff because it's descriptively accurate in the same way as if you get a computer engineering degree, you'll probably understand, you know, better where the next big thing is coming from from the tech world that said i think a lot of us who are involved in it the people involved in the academics the people involved in the broader community do generally have progressive goals we, we do come to it a lot of us uh, out of an opposition to austerity out of a recognition that mass unemployment is unjust and that the people from the civil rights tradition through to the labor tradition that have been pushing for full employment and a guaranteed right to a decent paying job uh, we're not just sort of idealists, but we're actually pointing something quite profoundly broken in our macroeconomic system. And more generally, that there are a lot of actors that currently enjoy the privilege to make money out of thin air and to enjoy credit creation privileges that, mostly speaking, are, are in the service of private interest. And so these sort of standard narratives you hear that printing money is going to cause the economy to collapse. Well, we, you know, actors are printing money every day. They're just not printing money on your behalf. <laughs> on behalf of the polity, they're printing money on behalf of others that get filthy rich. You know, that old joke, why did you rob the bank? Well, that's where the money is. You know, it's not sitting in a vault anymore. It wasn't even sitting in the vault in the past. It's that credit power. It's that power to mint something that we use as money that is the banking power. And it's a delegated public power from, from public authorities, from the legal charter that we give banks and the government supports that we give the banking system through FDIC insurance and through the Federal Reserve. So that's, I think, partially why there's been an increase in attention from people all sorts of backgrounds. Um, the other part, of course, is that in, historically speaking, the right, or at least some factions of the right, uh, have understood that money can be used like this. Very famously, Dick Cheney said, Ronald Reagan proved deficits don't matter. The only people that seem to think deficits matter are Democrats who let Republicans use it as a battering ram against their political agenda. Every time Republicans are in power, the first thing they do is cut taxes in a way that massively increases deficits. And their justification is, oh, it'll pay for itself over time with economic growth, which whether or not it's true in the long run is certainly not true in the short run and certainly not a guarantee, but it's enough of a justification to ignore the sort of dissonance between that and all of the deficit and debt fear mongering that they do whenever the Democrats are in power. So I think part of it is that this is an obvious thing. Every time the military budget has to be passed, nobody asks where the money is going to come from. Every time there's a tax cut, nobody asks what that's going to do with the budget, et cetera. Um, or at least most people who are passing them don't. Um, they wait till it's already passed and then they complain. And to go back to the other point, I mean, the description of reality versus the actual reality. You know, I think the, re uh, the history of the economics profession uh, is that it used to be called political economy. It used to be actually a sub growth of the legal departments, first of all. But since then, there has been a lot of effort and a lot of money funded by largely business interests to give the impression that economics is about the study of supply and demand, the study of markets, the study of the allocation of optimal resources under conditions of scarcity. And none of those things describe the actual economy we live in, certainly not completely and, and arguably not even partially, but they are a good starting point for telling a set of stories and creating a research paradigm uh, that is largely designed to serve certain ideological interests. So the kind of political economy that I studied is very different from the kind of thing that we call economics at Harvard, economics 101. 
or the kind that the mass textbooks that most people buy. And most people, including most journalists who then go on TV and talk about this stuff or who ask questions at presidential debates, don't actually get further than Econ 101, which is why if you're a politician and you say, well, that's just Economics 101, now that's a very powerful line because nobody actually took Econ 201. It's not in the public consciousness. So that idea, I think, of what the reality is versus what being described that reality is actually very important and mmt you know doesn't play the same game as a lot of standard econ which is we know it works more complicated than this but we are going to simplify it down to the public in ways that are stylized and lead the public to a particular set of conclusions so just as one really basic example and i'll stop the us has run a deficit pretty much consistently since 1788 there have been a couple of years where it didn't but over overall it has and Every year, it puts more money into the economy than it takes out, which means more people have money in their pockets than they give back. For a growing economy, that's normal. But we have come to the belief that a deficit is evidence of overspending and irresponsibility. We say, well, you wouldn't want to run a deficit as a person, as a household, even though practically speaking, businesses do that all the time. We just put that aside. We say, well, you wouldn't want to do it. You wouldn't live in the red ink. So the government shouldn't either. And we accept that because it sounds intuitive. But if you actually stop for a second, if you stop going nodding along and just critically quiz that for a second, it falls apart. It's like saying, well, the two football teams on the field need to earn points. So the referee also needs to earn points. And you go, well, no, the referee is the one who allocates the points to the teams when they do the thing, when they play the game. In fact, if the referee came onto the field and said, sorry, the Super Bowl is canceled this year because we've run out of points, we didn't tax enough points from the last year's Super Bowl. Um, they'd probably be booed off the field and have people throw food at them because it's an incoherent thing to say. But when it comes to the government, we've forgotten that the money doesn't just emerge out of the ground. It doesn't sort of grow on trees. It's something we have to actually create. And famously in 2009, Ben Bernanke was asked by 60 Minutes where the money to fund the bailout comes from. They said, was it taxpayer money? He said, no, we just used the computer to mark up the account. That's all. So there is this sort of general sense in which a lot of economics Standard economics gets reduced to simple, intuitive stories that are simple and wrong. Uh, and, and what MMT is doing is trying to start with a set of descriptive points that are accurate and then draw a set of implications for that for very important issues today. And one thing I think that would be helpful, you know, of course, as I was telling you, economics major, you're looking at a lot of these issues. A lot of them are very theoretical in nature, right? And economics by no means is a hard science. I think it'd be helpful maybe to walk through, uh, and of course, this is a little bit theoretical and we're, you know, uh, kind of making this up as we go. But let's say, you know, the U.S. was to implement the MMT policy that you or another policy, you know, maker kind of wanted to move forward with. What are the tangible impacts or benefits you think that, that looks like? And maybe let's look at two retrospective folks. And maybe let's look at like a white collar worker in Portland. Maybe they work for a big firm, they have good benefits, they make a six-figure salary. Then let's look at someone maybe in Burns, Oregon, who's a rancher or something like that. Mm -hmm. What is this kind of you know, economic system, how would that impact each of them in different ways, I guess? And obviously, that's somewhat theoretical because I'm sure that policymakers would have different solutions they'd want to implement with these new funds. But like, what does that difference kind of in everyday life look like, do you think, if, if the system was to be intact? So I think the first thing is that MMT, right, it's a theory. It's not modern money policy prescription. I have policy prescriptions. A lot of MMTers have policy prescriptions. The reason that we do this work, mm -hmm. as someone famously said, is not just to describe the world, but to change it. So that the descriptions are designed to serve ends. We, we, we stop and say, hey, if you touch that hot thing, uh, you'll burn your hand. Now that's a description, but the point is to tell someone that so that they don't put their hand on the thing and burn it, right? So there is a set of descriptions that we say, and in our view, most reasonable people who aren't sociopaths or sadists or bigots will hopefully want to come to similar conclusions that we do at at least a very general level once they understand the system works the way that we think it works. But you could theoretically come to very different conclusions and still see the world the same way at the sort of operational level. It's just, in our view, it would be a waste. It would be like knowing that, you know, the reason there's poverty isn't because people are lazy, but because of unjust social circumstances and still thinking it doesn't matter whether we should do anything about that. You can hold that view, but it's a damn shame in my opinion. And it, it puts you on the wrong side of a lot of history. 
so when it comes to these kinds of things, you know, there, there's a range of different policy prescriptions that I would say most of the leading MMT developers and thinkers would probably be in agreement on. And then there's stuff that some of us are in agreement on and others are relatively lukewarm, but don't oppose them. And then there are some things where we have, you know, good faith disagreements about the right way to fix the same problem. You know, hey, I would put a little more pepper in this. Well, I put a little bit more cream. Yeah, look, I get it, but I'd still do it my way. Okay. You know, it's that kind of disagreement. We don't, we, we both know how to cook. We're just disagreeing on the right way to make the, the favorite dish kind of thing. But from my point of view, you know, I guess it depends how many policy, how many policy changes you give me, right? If you're talking about just the big one, which is recognizing that we aren't living under conditions of monetary scarcity, that we aren't living in a world where the only way to pay Peter is to rob Paul, that we aren't living in a world where there's as much money last year as there is next year into infinity, that in fact, we grow the amount of spending and the, the circ circulation of credit every year. I think what that really does is it, it, it doesn't even lead to just one policy outcome. It leads to an entirely different way of asking questions. Someone says, for example, hey, we should probably prevent the heat death of the planet and most major bioecosystems. And someone says, wouldn't that be very expensive? And you go, I think it would probably be expensive to let everything die. The thing that's actually cheap is putting numbers on a computer screen. The thing that's expensive is dealing with the mass death of ecosystems and starvation and all that kind of stuff. So it gets us past that idea of you know money illusion, confusing the numbers on the page with the value. You don't eat dollars, you eat what dollars can make. And if the dollars aren't helping you make stuff to eat, they're not doing their job properly. So for example, the whole debate about the Green New Deal, right? it would be tremendously expensive to, to implement the Green New Deal. Well, expensive in what terms? In terms of numbers on a screen or in terms of social costs? Would it be tremendously expensive to prevent climate catastrophe? If it would be tr tremendously expensive to let it happen because we thought we didn't have enough money? Or you know, looking at, for example, COVID and, and what happened with the stimulus packages? Well, the the problem is that we gave people money and now we have inflation. Is that the problem? Was the better thing to let them starve in, in moments of crisis? Or is the problem that we had a massive economic shock where everybody stopped going to work? So productivity went down. We had a huge supply chain problem. And we had, for the first time in a really long time, a reduction in absolute poverty levels because we actually gave some people who didn't have enough for a long time some money. Now, you do those things and you don't actually take seriously the production side. You don't actually take seriously what you're making. You're going to have problems. No MMT is saying, throw money and don't worry about how you make stuff. We all care about productivity and production. It's the most important thing because we all are not thinking about money. We're thinking about the thing that money buys. And we knew that this was going to be a problem unless you actually lent into emergency production at the same time as emergency funding. And Biden did half of that really and not the other half that much. And to give you a contrasting example, during World War II, and it's often unfortunately during wars where the reality of how the monetary system becomes apparent to everybody, because during peace times, the most important political fights are keeping the working class down. But during war times, the most important fight is beating the other guys. And then suddenly you need to let the working class in on the game. So mostly for their cannon fodder, frankly, but also for their labor. And in World War II, what happened is we doubled real output in six years. We went from having no airline industry to having an airline industry. We went from having not that much steel to making a huge amount of steel. We went from not having the you know, nuclear science facilities to having them. And the way that we did that was we threw a huge amount of public investment, but we did it in a very carefully coordinated way. We made sure that private businesses weren't competing for the same steel contracts as we needed to win the war. We made sure that people who could be working were. So we had unemployment down to 1.2%. And I know that we've had, you know, 3% unemployment recently, and that sounds like a lot. But the difference between 3% unemployment and 1.2% is, is millions of people, millions and millions of people. It's not a trivial difference. And most importantly, when unemployment is that low, when you are close, but not actually there, but close as we've ever gotten, to a full employment economy, a real economy where you have a guaranteed right, no matter what, to, to have access to work. You still got to do the work, right? It's not guaranteed free money, it's guaranteed free access to paid work. In that world, we had some of the most strong labor movement we've ever seen, because the best way to have strong working rights is to know that your boss doesn't have your entire life in their hands. You can tell them to go stuff themselves and walk down the street and get a different job and someone else will be happy to hire you because there's more need for workers than there are workers. And you can go back centuries and find this. After the Black Death, it was one of the periods where 
the peasantry demanded rights and actually got them because there were so few people left that all the people who needed the peasants to do all the work were actually in a dependent position for a change. So having a system where we are not constantly asking how you're going to pay for it, but we're asking how you're going to find the real resources. Is this the best use of these resources? If we've got 10,000 people coming out every year of the university system trained in X, Y, Z, is that the best way for them to be deployed to serve social purposes or should they be put elsewhere or should they be encouraged to be put elsewhere? It doesn't have to be some command and control system. It can be just a system of incentives and encouragement or at least multiple options. And then secondly, are we actually putting all of our resources to work in a sustainable way? Are we, you know, labor is a sustainable resource. Carbon is not. And so if you are, for example, looking at two ways of producing something and one is heavy on labor and the other is heavy on uh, non-renewable resources. According to one theory, you might say, well, it's cheaper to buy, to use the coal because, you know, workers are expensive. They cost a lot of money for business. But on the other hand, it's actually probably a lot cheaper in the long run to, to use labor than it might be to use some sort of machine that is dependent on destroying ecosystems we need to survive. So those are some of the big things that I would say that MMT helps us understand. The other big one, I think, is recognizing that the state of investment, the state of, of availability of credit and the price of interest, right? interest rates, what we talk about monetary policy today is really setting interest rates. It's not the quantity of money, it's the price of money. And we give the impression that that price is set by private markets. Famously, Paul Volcker switched from a system where the Fed would say, here's the target rate, it's this number, to saying, here's a target band. We're going to try and get the target rate within that band plus 50 and minus 50 basis points or something rather than setting it at zero rather than setting it two percent you set it somewhere between 1.75 and 2.25 and you can go back and look at the federal reserve transcripts from those meetings and the board members say we want to give the appearance that market forces are doing this we want to use the camouflage literal word quote from one of the board of governor members in the meeting we want to use the camouflage of market forces so that when we raise interest rates and cause workers to go out of work so that we are breaking the back of unions so they don't demand higher wages, so that businesses don't try to offset those wages by raising prices, so we're going to keep prices low by keeping workers' wages low, they say this explicitly, that we're not going to get in trouble for it, that we're not going to get yelled at in Congress, that we're not going to have people throwing tomatoes at our face on the street when we leave the Federal Reserve Building. We're going to hide the things that we're doing politically and in terms of our policy behind the camouflage of private markets. And I think that's encapsulated most concisely by the democratic political strategist for Bill Clinton, James Carville, who famously said, when I die, I want to come back as the bond markets as a ghost because they can scare everybody. And what we are seeing in recent years, which is a big paradigm shift and not one that everybody was embracing, but one that changing circumstances forced everybody to admit, is that those interest rates are not set by markets. They're set by central banks. When the Bank of Japan says I want interest rates to be X, they are X. And if you as a market participant bet against that, you are going to lose money. They call it the widow maker trade. Yeah, and I think, and, and tell me if I'm summarizing this wrong, but it's, it's very interesting to hear you kind of talk about this, both at the high level, but then at the practical level, in terms of someone who is, let's say, pro-MMT, or at least embraces the theory. And obviously, from what you're saying, the policy prescriptions are different. But you're essentially saying you know, full employment or Green New Deal or Medicare for all, or, hey, we can even have some right-wing policies. Uh, maybe I want, you know, a $5 trillion military instead of the $780 billion military. You're basically saying this isn't necessarily a monetary choice that we're making. This is actually a policy choice that we're making. Or what the folks in power, whether that be a combination of the Fed plus Congress, that's actually, again, they're you know, they're trying to conflate it basically with economics, but you're saying essentially, no, this is actually a policy choice of why we're not doing this. Did I, did I summarize that correctly? Absolutely. Right. Somebody who's got money in their pocket and they walk past a homeless person, they say, oh, sorry, you got no money. You know, there's a reason you say that, but it's not that you don't actually have any money. Right. And so every time that the military comes to Congress and says, hey, we think we need $700 billion this year. And Congress goes, well, we all want to be seen as being pro-military. So why don't you take $800 billion? Nobody asks where that money comes from, right? They know that this is the game when it matters. 
The only people that they say this stuff to that believe it are the ones asking for that other stuff. Gotcha. Yeah, that's a that's a very interesting framework because I can I can see as I was telling you right, this is the idea of MMT has gained popularity on the right in terms of either paying for specific social programs like fast expanding child tax credit or EITC or farm subsidies, relocation subsidies, or things like that. I can totally see how someone who's a little bit more populist on the right may feel very open to embracing this because, again, as you said, it's not a monetary choice, it's a policy choice. I think that's a, that's a great encapsulation of that, at least in terms of helping me understand it. Yeah, there's one more thing on that, which is once you realize that, and actually, funnily enough, it was a man named Beardsley Rummel, who was the president of the New York Federal Reserve, and he was giving a speech to the American Bar Association. So me as a lawyer interested in money, it's a great it's a great setting for the joke, right? For the punchline. Yeah. Uh, he, he, gave a speech, he gave a speech in 1945 called Taxes for Revenue Are Obsolete. And what he said is, in a world where we make our own money, we have our own central bank, we are off the gold standard, right? We do not need taxes for raising revenue. The line he says, the purpose of taxes should never be obscured under the mask of raising revenue. Now, he is a pro-business guy. He was, the, I think it was the CEO of General Mills or something, or one of those kinds of companies. But he also invented mm-hmm. the pay-as-you-go tax system. He was a tax expert, right, that we still use today. And he was actually using that as an argument for saying we should get rid of the corporate income tax, saying it was a badly designed tax. We don't need the money, and it's not good for society for all the actual reasons we should tax. But he comes up with this very mm-hmm. useful framework for wh- how we should look at taxes. It's not that taxes are unimportant, right? Often people will hear what I'm saying and go, well, why don't we just give everyone a trillion dollars like it's Oprah Winfrey? Like, look under your chair, there's a trillion dollars, you know? Well, as I said before, the money has to buy something. Right? You, you can't push the money further than our productive limits. What I think the World War II story shows us is our productive limits are often way higher than we think. It's sort of like we've been living on three hours of sleep for years and years. And someone said, have you tried getting a full night's sleep? And you're like, oh my gosh, it's an entirely different world. Our brain works entirely differently, right? We have been starving ourselves of growth for most of, most of the last two, 300 years on this stuff. So it's not that we think that there's a free lunch in general. It's that we think that we are having a bunch of people that want to make packed lunches and they're just sitting there next to a bunch of sandwich materials and not doing it because we're not paying them to do it. But the point of his thing was he said that one thing that taxes can be used for is to essentially drain money back out, right? You put money in people's pockets by running a deficit, you tax it back out, there's less money in people's pockets to spend. So one way you deal with inflation is you simply have a reflux. Stuff goes in, stuff goes out. Not because you need the money to pay for the next round, but because you are sucking some stuff back out. Therefore, you're making more room next time to put more in in a different place in a different way. Another thing you can do is to localize the cost. You've got a particular program. You want to know exactly how much it's going in and out. You can slap a tax next to the spending side. Another thing you could do uh, with taxes is to is to allow certain entities to fund themselves, give them certain powers, like the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau can impose fees and fines, which allows it to fund itself, et cetera. So he comes up with a list of ways that we can use taxation, right? Another is just redistribution. Some people have too much, take it away from them. And interestingly enough, you can say, well, the Laffer curve, that famous right-wing concept where there's an optimal level of taxation. If you tax people 100%, you get no tax revenue. If you tax them at 0%, you get no tax revenue. So somewhere between 0 and 100, there's this optimal tax rate to maximize revenue, right? That's the Laffer curve. Well, what if you don't need to maximize revenue? What if you are like me, someone who believes the existence of billionaires is a policy failure? We can tax them at 100%. And someone says, well, there'll be no more billionaires. I say, good. Sounds like the tax is working. Well, you won't get any revenue. I say, that's fine. I don't need the revenue. I just need there to be no more billionaires. So you can actually do things with the taxation system that's very different once you get away from the myth that the point of taxes is to, uh, is to generate revenue. But the flip side is also true. Right now, the average person earning $50,000 or less is probably way more heavily taxed than your average billionaire. Probably in, in rel- definitely in relative terms, relative to their overall wealth. But sadly, probably in real terms too. <laughs> Right? They're probably paying more dollars in taxes than your average billionaire who can afford an army of tax lawyers to make sure that any dollar they you know, earn never sees a, a daylight in a, a tax man dollar. So you can have a MMT regime and say, well, part of this is the average person is grossly overtaxed. Right? The average, certainly average working class person is grossly overtaxed. And maybe certain people are grossly undertaxed. 
and the fact that they say, well, if you tax me more, I won't earn any revenue is, is less convincing than it used to be. Yeah, that, that's interesting. So we talked a little bit about debt earlier, and I definitely want to get to the debt ceiling since I think uh, a lot of folks have that mind if we're at top of mind, at least if we're actually going to come to a default, which I personally don't think is going to happen. It seems to always have quite a bit of buildup. And then at the end of the day, the debt ceiling gets lifted. But tell us just from a high level to start, what is the debt ceiling? Like what, what even is that basically? Why is there a debt ceiling and what happens if the debt ceiling is breached? Thank you for the question. Yeah. So I think the first thing, and this is a bit of a hard conceptual thing. So hopefully I can say it and people can chew on it for a second and then we can get to the debt ceiling, which is the difference between money and debt is not as big as most people think. If you look at the money in your pocket, the green pieces of paper, it will say Federal Reserve note. And they don't mean note as in it's made out of paper. They mean note as in a legal debt. When you get a mortgage, technically, the technical term is a mortgage note. If you get a car loan, the technical term is a car note. If you write an IOU saying IOU $100 next Wednesday, that could be described as a promissory note. So the Federal Reserve note in your pocket is actually a promise. It's an IOU. It is a debt. Then what is it supposed to repay? Because you take a $100 bill to the bank and they'll give you five $20 bills, right? The thing that it's promising you is that thing I said at the beginning, legal relief, legal liability relief, get out of jail free, get away from the tax man, get away from the, the people trying to take away your car because you've got too many speeding tickets, right? If you have that money, the government has to give you a check against your name worth $100 for anything they want to be able to tax or fine you or whatever else. That's their promise to you. If you're holding that thing that says it's legal tender for all public or private, that's a promise. It's a debt. The thing about this that is different from the way we normally think about debt is it's zero interest and it has no maturity. The $100 bill in your pocket, you can cash at any time. You don't go to the bank and say, here's a $100 bill. And they say, well, can you wait three months? Can you wait 30 years? No, they'll give it to you right then. And they won't give you any interest. The national debt, what we call the national debt, is basically a form of high denomination money that earns interest and like a savings account, has some degree of duration. The shortest form, the shortest duration form of public debt is a three month treasury bill. And the longest is a 30 year treasury bond. And in the middle, there's things called notes. So you've got bonds, notes, and, and bills. It's sort of like your small, medium, large at McDonald's. And they can pay positive interest, but they can also pay zero interest. For most of the 2010s, the short term interest rate was zero. So you get a three month treasury bill and you get a hundred dollar bill, they pay the same interest. In theory, the three-month bill, you have to wait three months to cash it in, sort of like a savings checking account. But if you, for people who are old enough, back in the day, it was actually hard to get your money out of a savings account. Nowadays, if you've got a certificate of deposit for 12 months or something, you need to cash it out, you can. What, what do you have to do? You just have to pay a bit of a premium. You have to pay a bit of a cost, right? You have to pay a price for, for coming out early. It's sort of like canceling a membership at the gym early, right? They, they'll let you do it. It just costs a little bit more. So. The things that we call the national debt are high denomination money. They're money for investors, for banks, for hedge funds, et cetera. I had a friend of mine who was a treasurer at Goldman Sachs. He wasn't like in the treasury department of the government. He was in the treasury of Goldman Sachs, which meant his job was to keep the cash flow coming in and out of their main spending account for everything they use. And I said to him, do you store your money in you know, cash under the mattress? He said, of course not. I said, do you store it in a bank account? He said, no. I said, why not? He said, because a bank account has an FDIC insurance only up to how much? $250,000, right? You walk into a bank, you'll see that little square in the corner, $250,000 FDIC insurance. But Goldman Sachs is dealing with millions and millions of dollars every day. So what do you store your cash in? He said, three month T-bills, three month treasury bills. So I said to him, so when you guys talk about cash, you're talking about three month treasury bills. He said, yep. I said, even though it's debt, he said, well, it's money to us, right? So that, that's the first thing is to understand that what we think of as the national debt and what we think of as public money more broadly are not mutually exclusive. The national debt is a subsection of the public monetary regime. It's a specific kind. It's different from the coins. It's different from the, the, the greenback notes. It's its own kind. And so what the debt ceiling is, is a limit on the number of those that you can issue. There are in fact, other kinds of limits. The ones issued by the Federal Reserve in your pocket don't have a limit, but the earlier version of those that was actually not issued by the Fed 
it was issued by the Treasury. It was called the Greenback, and it was issued during Lincoln's time. And there was even a political party called the Greenbacker Party. And there is a law on the books today from the Civil War era that says that the Treasury can issue up to 300 million, which is not very much money today. Obviously, it would fund the government for about 30 minutes uh, or less. But in 1860, it's quite a lot. It'll help you win the Civil War, in fact. You can issue that up to 300 million, and it does not add to the national debt at all. It's paper money out there. It doesn't add to the national debt, and the Treasury issues it without having to sell it to bond markets or anybody else. The same is true, and we can get to this in a second, of the coins. The coins will usually not have a cap on the total amount you can issue. There's no quantitative cap. There's no total amount. The mint never gets a phone call saying you've issued enough coins today. You know, go home, mint, you're drunk, no more. No, they won't say that. But there are limits on the quality of the coin. Oh, you can only issue nickels that are worth five cents. You can only issue dimes that are worth 10 cents. So you have qualitative caps on some instruments and you have quantitative caps on other instruments. The national debt as a cap, why do we even have a cap at all, given that we raise it every few years, or at least we're supposed to? The answer is it was designed to make it easier, not harder, for the Treasury to spend. Not spend whatever they want, not some unilateral executive run amok, not some sort of imperial president secretly funding slush funds in Guantanamo or Nicaragua, none of that stuff. I'm talking about the money that Congress passes a budget saying to the president, you have to execute the laws that we pass. There is a famous Supreme Court case from 1838 called Kendall v. Stokes, where the Supreme Court said, when the Congress has uh, declared certain sums are to be spent, the executive branch has no constitutional power not to spend them. That is to say, when Congress says jump, the executive has to say how high, that's it. The debt ceiling was an invention in the 20th century. Before that, Whenever Congress passed a bill saying spend a certain amount, they would also pass a financing bill saying, and in order to do that, here's where you get revenue. One way to do it would be through minting coins, what they call signage. The difference between the face value of the coin and the cost of getting the metal was basically free money. You, you make a coin worth a dollar, it costs you 10 cents to get the metal. You issue it and it's worth a dollar because it's legal tender. Well, that's 90 cents that you now just got to make out of thin air. Another way was taxes, although in the early republic, in the early 18, uh, 19th century and late 18th century, much more than taxes, the most common way was customs. Right? You'd get them at the border, not once they're inside. So that was another way you got revenue. And then nowadays, of course, if you're in Ferguson, Missouri, the way you do it is through traffic stops of African-Americans so that you can fund the police budget or whatever else. You use fines and fees and whatever else, right? The cost to get the DMV license that they fail you twice so that you have to take the test again or whatever it is. So these are the ways that you would get revenue. And in, in, in the original eras of the US Republic, they would make you, uh, that Congress would pass a bill saying, spend a certain amount and here's the sources of revenue, taxes or whatever else. By the time you get to World War I, it's a big government. It's a complicated government. It's a government trying to win a very expensive and difficult war overseas. And so the Congress says, we are gonna stop micromanaging. We're gonna give you a limit. It's like you had 10 different credit cards for different things. We're gonna give you one big credit card with one big limit. And all the different things we tell you to spend, you can use this one limit to do it all. By the time you get to the 1930s, that's sort of really settled and congealed into one single limit. And you have Treasury Secretary Mellon, a former banker saying, honestly, if we're looking into the future, the Treasury should have complete discretion in what it chooses to finance. Congress tells us what to spend and we are the executive, we work out how to get it done. And that's largely how it has worked over the years. And the debt ceiling was just something we raised every now and again as a sort of procedural thing. There are a few fights, people sort of weaponized it politically. But it wasn't really until the Reagan era and then afterwards really in with the Obama era that it became the sort of central focus point for all budget politics. It became the place where people who were in the minority primarily would use it to relitigate spending that had already been passed. They knew that they weren't gonna win an actual up and down vote in Congress. So they waited to find that one weakness where, hey, it's my job to pay the electricity bill, but I'm not gonna do it. Now you all have to come to me and negotiate because my name is on the account, that kind of thing. You have to negotiate with me about cleaning the dishes in a different way, that I don't want to clean the dishes anymore and I'm not going to pay the electrical bill. And you can't change it because it's under my name, that kind of thing. So the debt ceiling was originally designed to actually make it easier 
for the executive branch to do what needs to be done to honor Congress's spending commitments. But like so many laws, it has been twisted and turned into something very different from what it was originally designed to do. And nowadays it's mostly a political football. Mm -hmm. And so we reached the debt limit, which I know the dates here are always very confusing. It's like, well, this is technically the debt, the debt limit, but then there's certain things, the treasury secretary, the extraordinary measures, whatever those are, mm -hmm. I imagine they're probably not that extraordinary given it's probably happened a number of times at this point. So we come to some date, yeah, which if they, not if they call them in June. Sorry, if they call them accounting gimmicks, then it would be harder to dismiss other things by calling them accounting gimmicks, but that's what they are. Extraordinary measures are yes, yes. various accounts. Yeah, essentially some sort of accounting gimmick, you know, and we can send these payments from, you know, February to June or whatever the specific dates are. I, I don't know what they are off the top of my head. I'm sure that you probably do, but let's say we do not reach that, that an agreement by that date. And essentially the debt limit is the debt limit. What happens with that? Or I, from my understanding, the United States basically defaults on its debt, you know, public stock market mayhem, that sort of thing. But technically, what happens there? Like, is the government not allowed to print new debt or call for new debt at that point? Or what sort of happens once they actually reach that ceiling? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. Um, the debt ceiling for a long time was in place, and then it would be raised. After 2013, they actually changed the structure where what they do now is they suspend the debt ceiling. They pass a law saying the ceiling that was previously in place is now suspended. It doesn't exist for two years. We'll revisit it in two mm, years. Okay. Right? And in two years, on that, that day, that's, that's why the crisis now is a little bit more reoccurring. That's right. It, well, it used to reoccur, but now it's more regular. <laughs> They've made it so that instead of Got hitting it, the limit okay. whenever you happen to hit it, you hit it on a certain date. So rather than it being active all the time and then someone calls you saying you're about to hit your credit limit, they say, you don't have a credit limit, but we're going to have a two-month check-in to see what you're spending. And we're going to have that conversation every two months on this date. So every two years, roughly since 2013, or sometimes it's less than that, the debt ceiling is reinstated. It sort of comes back into force. It's like someone was on a hiatus and now they're back on the TV show. But they're only back there for like one episode, guest starring, and then they leave again. So the debt ceiling is, is suspended for two years, and then it's in place for a day, and then it's suspended again for two years. What happens on that day? What happens on the week up to that day? A lot of political grandstanding, a lot of gnashing of teeth, a lot of fighting, right? And then they pass it. Unless one side decides to play hardball like this. When Trump was in power, the Democrats passed it. They weren't interested in, in using the football this way. There was a government shutdown about the budget, but it was about Trump's spending. It wasn't about the debt ceiling. Since 2011, Republicans have played increasingly hardball versions of refusing to re-suspend or raise the debt ceiling. So it's been getting harder and harder just to, to have that moment where it gets re-suspended again. And when they re-suspend it, what they do is they retroactively increase it. They say, okay, it was suspended. Now we're going to increase it and say that it was actually whatever number we needed it to be for the last two years up until now. And then we're going to suspend it again. Two years later, we're going to do the same thing. It's all accounting gimmicks, right? So what happens then in, if we hit that limit, first of all, we've hit the limit now. Technically, we're not supposed to be issuing more treasury securities. So we are finding other places in the budget to get additional funds. It's sort of like, hey, I think I had a hundred bucks in my, my old wallet. I'm going to go find that. You know, I had a friend who owed me some money. I'm going to call them and see if they can pay me. I've got, an old, uh, I've got an old couch that I wanted to sell. So I'm going to try to sell that for a few dollars. But you, know, you're, you don't have income anymore. You don't have a job. You don't, you don't have the ability to finance yourself the way you normally did. Your credit card is still suspended, whatever it is you want to call it. Now, the question of what happens when you run out of all those other sources is actually legally very interesting because the Constitution says, first of all, that Congress chooses what to spend and the president's job is to do it. And particularly the 14th Amendment that we all know of usually is the one with all that stuff about equal protection. Uh, it was passed after the Civil War. It was designed primarily to prevent the Confederacy from taking over the government again in the future or trying to. The 14th Amendment says that the validity of the public debt shall not be questioned. Not just the national debt, but all of the debts that we have. People who are owed social security, government employees, people who've got contracts with the government, state and localities that are waiting on money from the government to fund X, Y, Z. But no one, not the president, not even Congress itself, has the power to retroactively undo those debts. Certainly not even the Supreme Court either. So at that moment, we hit the debt ceiling. There are other scholars, constitutional scholars, that have said what the president is faced with is essentially a bind, a trilemma, a sort of impossible trinity, where Congress has said spend X, tax Y, 
and only issue debt, national debt, public debt up to Z. And if the amount that you need to spend, if X is bigger than the amount that you can tax and the amount that you can issue debt, well, what are you going to do? You're in a bind, right? That's, that's the story. Their answer in that moment is that the president has a constitutional responsibility to ignore the debt ceiling and keep spending because of those three options, spending and taxing are core legislative powers. That's the sort of essence of the power of the purse. The debt ceiling was always a gimmick. It was always an accounting thing. It was never designed to stop spending happening. So of those three, if you have to ignore one, ignore the dumb accounting gimmick and honor Congress's spending and taxing requirements because that is the appropriate balance of power between these different options. Right? That is, is very different from whether or not there is a trillion dollar coin that could be issued under obscure provision of the Coinage Act that says that the Treasury Secretary can mint and issue coins of whatever denomination they want and that that could be used as a fourth option because you can't tax money that you don't spend, uh, already have in existence. You can't borrow money you don't already have in existence. And so when we are trying to work out what options the president has at their disposal, it's not simply X, Y, or Z. There's also a fourth option, which is if they can create money, they could use that to honor their spending commitments. And that has the benefit of not being inconsistent, of not being at odds with all of the other rules. So suddenly you don't have to choose what they call the least unconstitutional option. You can actually choose one that's legal. You have an illegal option, right? If you have to choose amongst unconstitutional options, if you're in an impossible situation where whatever you do, you are violating your constitutional responsibilities, sure, the best answer is to ignore the debt zone rather than to unilaterally choose what to spend and what not to spend. But if there is a legal option on the table, even if it sounds wacky, even if it sounds zany, even if it sounds like it's a stretching an existing law beyond what we thought we, it was supposed to be for, it is still much better to do that than to openly ignore the constitution, openly ignore what Congress said and for the president to go rogue. But what we have right now is a democratic party in power that essentially wants to play political chicken with the Republicans. I think Republicans are being extremely irresponsible with this, by the way. This is the only country in the world that really has a debt ceiling like this. Denmark has one kind of, but they don't ever have problems with passing it. But this is the only country in the world where this even exists. And, and I think it's a very cynical move to use it as a political football like this. But the Democrats are playing the same game just on the other side in the sense that they could get rid of this tomorrow. They could say, look, this is dumb. This is cynical politics. We are not going to play it. No matter what happens, we will make sure that we can continue to spend what we are supposed to spend. And if we have to use a silly coin, we will. We don't want to. We think we should do it the normal way. But if the, al if the alternative is, is catastrophic default, well, that's not actually allowed. The Supreme Court doesn't let us. The Constitution doesn't let us. The separation of powers don't let us. And the plain language of the law doesn't let us. So we will not be considering that at all. It's off the table. It will remain off the table 100%. But they don't say that. Why don't they say that? Because they want to essentially put the pressure on Republicans to negotiate by blaming them for any economic crisis that might happen. They want to tell the public, hey, these people are being crazy. They're driving down the highway at 100 miles an hour, driving straight at us. And then you say to them, well, why don't you just get off the road then? And they say, no, 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 no. That would be unfair. No, no, no. We're going to keep driving 100 miles ahead, us too. But look how crazy they are that they're not getting off the road. And you're like, it's a single lane road. You know, one of you has to get off. If they're being crazy, you need to get off. No, no, no. They need to get off. Well, it takes two to play chicken. And you are lying to the public about the options available to you. Uh, show that you can make it seem like the other side will be responsible if something goes badly. So it's, it, in that sense, it's a sort of pox on both houses, although I obviously think the Democrats are responding to this situation, but they are certainly not being honest about the ways to fix it that they have available at their disposal, because to do so in their mind would take the pressure off the political hardware they're playing with the other side. 
Gotcha. And I'll just ask one more policy question. You've been very generous with your time and thank you again. But so, and just to backtrack, you're essentially advocating for, uh, and I'll, I'll make sure to put some links in the bio for this since I know this is definitely more complicated stuff that's subject to just for one more question. But basically that U.S. Treasury should mint a trillion dollar coin to essentially pay off certain amounts of debt so the debt ceiling is not reached. Would that allow for more debt or what is actually the mechanics in terms of what the what the coin would do? Yeah, sorry, I should have been more clear about that. So when you issue treasury debt today, the treasury sells that to a group of financial actors who have a special privilege. They're part of a small club called the primary dealers. They have a sort of special relationship with the treasury and the Fed, which means they get to be the only ones in the room. It's like a special auction at Sotheby's or something, you know, for a priceless artwork. You know, only 10 people get in the room. They get to be in the room, they get to be the first ones to buy it, and then they sell it to anybody else. But there's always one person who's willing to buy anything from them if they want to sell it at a certain price, and that's the Federal Reserve. Right now, the Federal Reserve is sitting on, I think, what, $5 trillion or whatever it is of, of U.S. Treasury debt, and they've bought more in the past. They could buy more. They, they don't have any constraints about how much they buy. So often what happens, and sort of on an ongoing basis, on, an, on a daily basis, this is how it works, is the Treasury issues some Treasuries into the economy, and the Fed buys up some Treasuries from the economy so that the balance is roughly where the Fed wants it to be. The effect of that is basically that the Treasury is selling those directly to the Fed using the private markets as a middleman. If you remember I said before about Volcker using the camouflage of market forces, right? This idea that we are not funding ourselves, but we are doing it through markets is an important fiction politically for certain groups that want to give the impression that private finance has a sort of veto power on government action. That if the Wall Street doesn't like what they're doing, they will show up in them not buying government bonds. But the functional effect is that the money that everybody is using to buy the treasury from the government itself. It's like you, you have to sell this to the market. Uh, you, you know, mum sells the debt to the market and dad buys it from the market. Well, you know, where did the money come from? It came from the same place. It's the same family bank account. It's like, you know, you, your mum buys the chocolates and then you go sell them, but really you're selling them at your dad's work and your dad's buying the chocolates, you know? It's just your family's just subsidizing you thinking that you're out there selling chocolates. So that's how government debt is sold today. With the coin, the mint would take the coin, deposit it at the Fed, just like you would take a $100 bill and deposit it at your bank. The Fed now owns the coin, just like the bank owns your $100 bill. They don't put it in a special vault marked you as the customer. They take your $100 bill and they give you money in your bank account. So the mint would get a mm. trillion dollars in its bank account. And the Fed just, as I said before, like Ben Bernanke, they just mark that up with the computer. But it doesn't matter for the Fed because the Fed's getting an asset worth a trillion dollars, right? They're giving you a trillion dollars in an account and they've got an asset worth a trillion dollars. Just like if they buy up a treasury debt, a treasury bill for a million dollars, they will put a million dollars in whoever's account they bought that from and they will get an asset worth a million dollars. So the mint deposits the coin at the Fed. The Fed says, look, mint, I've got some good news for you. Look at your bank account. The mint types up in their Fed bank account and suddenly they see a lot of zeros in there. And they go, wow, it's Christmas. And then the treasury secretary calls the mint and says, I'd like to take the spare funds you have and sweep them into the regular treasury account, which the treasury is allowed to do. So now that money goes into the regular treasury account, just like any other money that comes in, just like tax revenue, just like the money from bond sales, it ends up in the exact same account to be spent. One of my good friends and one of the early Mint the Coin developers, Stephanie Kelton, who was Bernie Sanders' chief economic advisor, and she authored a great book called The Deficit Myth um, that was read all over Congress and got a huge you know, New York Times bestseller. She likes to say cash registers don't discriminate. Somebody comes to pay a cash register, they don't say, did this money come from taxes or did it come from minting a coin? <laughs> they don't ask, they don't care, so it doesn't matter. It's the same money, right? And the only other big thing that comes up there is people ask whether it's inflationary. And, you know, plenty of people from Paul Krugman through to the Minneapolis Federal Reserve President, Mariana Kokolakota, even through to conservatives will say that actually this is no different than issuing debt. If you issue a three-month T-bill worth a million dollars and you issue a million-dollar bill worth a million dollars, it's pretty much the same. The only difference is the interest rate. And at this point, we are paying interest on 
any cash that we issue to reserves, what they call interest on reserves at the Fed anyway. So it's not just quote unquote government debt that pays interest, it's also any account at the mint. So there's no real difference even on the interest rate. So again, Stephanie Kelton has this great line. She said, it's, it's less like the difference between money and debt, and it's more like the difference between green money and yellow money. In my country, all the different dollar bills are um, different colors. So the $5 bill is purple and the $100 bill is green and the $50 bill is yellow. So that makes a little more sense to me than maybe it does to Americans where all your money is green. But if you think yeah. of the difference, normally we run, it, we run a deficit by issuing high denomination yellow money. And now we're talking about running a deficit by issuing really high denomination platinum colored money. Then that makes, I think, the comparison a little bit more on point. Yeah, well, no, it's a it's a, a very interesting idea, and yeah, I'm sure I'm certain some of our listeners have probably heard some of the interviews that you've given on, and I'm definitely going to link to some of those in the bio as well, the pods, so other folks can go and check that out. Yeah, there's a website we created called mintthecoin.org, and it's got a lot of resources. It's got links to a lot of the legal history, uh, as well as a seminar that we just put on recently with the former mint director Philip Deal, who was the author of this law. He he wrote it, and then Congress passed it. So if you want to learn more about it, mintthecoin.org is the place to go for resources. Gotcha. And that was going to be my last question anyway, was if folks want to go find you, they want to listen to more interviews, they want to read more of your writing, maybe send you an email or something like that. Where can they go to, to find more of your work? rowangray.net is my personal website. And my email is rowan at rowangray.net. And it's rowan with an H, like Rohan, but it's pronounced rowan like rowing a boat. All right. Well, thank you so much again for your time. And everybody, thanks again for listening. And we'll see you in the next one. Thank you very much.